distinguished guest, uh, Mr. Bagic, who is the uh, Turkish Minister for European Union Affairs and also the Chief Negotiator, and is also unique from our perspective because he is the first minister who has visited us twice. So this isn't the first time he's speaking, which makes it particularly impressive that we have a large turnout. Uh, so obviously people appreciated him the first time, um, but we have a lot of fresh faces here in the audience as well, which makes me happy that we have a lot of students who are in this building for the first time. So our institute is fulfilling our mission of bringing uh, foreign political issues, international relations issues uh, to a wider audience. And so that always makes me uh, very happy. Um, so. Uh, since we have a guest who is already well known to Estonians, there's not much of an introduction uh, that needs to be made. And without any further ado, uh, Sibash, the floor is yours, and we will have time for questions and answers. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be back at the Institute and share some of our views about not only Turkish-Estonian relations, or Turkish EU relations, but what's happening in the world. I really feel privileged to be at a friendly territory because every time I come to Estonia, it boosts my morale, my motivation about the future of Turkish EU relations. It's good to be in a country where we have solid, concrete support. I just came out of a very fruitful, constructive meeting with the Prime Minister, and after this, I will be meeting the Foreign Minister. And uh, every time I meet with them, I feel that I'm uh, recharging my batteries for the determination of Turkish EU relations and Turkish Estonian relations. We actually reiterated with Prime Minister that Turkey and Estonia enjoy excellent relations. Turkey welcomed the re-independence of Estonia, uh, was one of the first countries to do so. We very strongly supported Estonia's NATO membership bid, and we enjoy great support from Estonia in our membership bid to the EU. Turkish Air Forces joined NATO's Baltic Air Police Mission, and female Turkish pilots were very popular here when they were uh, conducting uh, the, the, the job. But recently, Estonia proved her friendship her alliance once again in the aftermath of the devastating earthquake in the province of Van, Estonia decided to donate 100,000 euros to Turkish Red Crescent, which was very symbolic, which was very meaningful, and we are grateful for that. And in the aftermath of the terrorist attacks where Turkish soldiers were uh, killed, Estonia was one of the countries that made the strongest statement against PKK terrorism and declared once again that PKK, which is on the list of terrorist organizations of the European Union, uh, is a deadly organization and sided alongside Turkey in the fight against international terrorism. Uh, of course, the relations are excellent and I told uh, Prime Minister, that the only thing missing is the visit of my Prime Minister, on which we're working. Last year he was scheduled to come, but uh, because of a constitutional uh, crisis in Turkey, we had to postpone it. But the Prime Minister's office in Ankara is now working on his uh, visit to come to Tallinn. Of course, when talking about Turkey and EU, uh, it's not a new story. Turkey's first application to the European Economic Zone of the time was in 1959, 52 years ago. It took us 45 years, believe it or not, to get a date to start accession negotiations. No country has waited as long. No country has been as determined, as resolute on the EU path as Turkey has. Since 2004, Turkey has started the <coughs> negotiation process. So far, we have opened 13 of the 33 chapters. Of the remaining 20 chapters, 17 of them are politically blocked by some member states that lack the vision 
for Europe's future, but Turkey is determined to continue on the reform process. We see EU to be Turkey's dietitian. We all know in order to lead a healthy life, we have to watch what we eat and we need to exercise very regularly, but we tend to be lazy at times. But when a dietitian gives us a prescription of what to eat for lunch or breakfast and dinner, what to eat in between those meals, how to exercise every day, at least 40 minutes of cardio activity, and when you implement it, you actually become a healthy person. 27 countries are healthier today because they have implemented the EU Aki, which is the prescription. The dietitian himself might be moody, might have a few clogged arteries, might be overweight, but that doesn't make the prescription bad. The prescription is still the best around. And that's what Turkey intends to implement. Some of the countries might have economic problems. Thank God Estonia is doing much better compared to the rest of Europe. And they are not doing so well because they are not implementing their own prescription. 16 of the 27 member states, they are not in line with master criteria, but Turkey is. That is why last year, in 2010, we had 8.9% economic growth. In the first half of 2011, we had 10.2% economic growth. But that growth is fueled by foreign investment coming into Turkey. And let me share the news with you. 92% of foreign direct investment that came into Turkey in the first half of this year came from EU member states. So the business decision makers, the economic circles in Europe are much ahead of some of the political leaders in some member states. They understand Turkey's potential. They understand what Turkey has to offer. They understand that Turkey's median age is 28 when the median age in Europe is 43. That Turkey's growth is not only a short-term process, a long-term endeavor, because we have a young population coming. I happen to be one of the youngest ministers in Turkish government, but 65% of my nation is younger than I am. So we have a very dynamic population, consumers, workers, that are going to continue with this growth. Energy is a very important issue in growth, in industrialization. 70% of the energy resources Europe needs today are either to the south or north or east of Turkey. I always argue that unless someone comes up with a new technology of wireless transfer of energy resources, Turkey's cooperation is a must to solve Europe's energy challenges, to diversify energy sources and routes, and that's where Turkey plays a very important role. But it is a shame that a beautiful island in the Mediterranean, which has no energy problems of its own, at least had no energy problems of its own until the electricity generation power plant had an explosion, is blocking the chapter on energy from being opened for negotiations. It's simply silly, which must come to an end. 26 other member states should tell Cyprus not to block Turkey's energy chapter because it's hurting the interests of European public opinion and European public at large. Turkey has also economic benefits for Europe. We are a market of 74 million people. But within three hours of flying from Istanbul, European companies can reach 1.5 billion consumers who are ready, willing and able to use European products and services. So Turkey is a hub as well. But most importantly, Turkey has been a source of inspiration for dynamism and economic growth to the countries to our west. But more importantly, Turkey has become a source of inspiration for democracy and human rights to the countries to our east. When you see people, teenagers, who risk their lives in Libya, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Syria, to demand what Turkey has, democracy, better jobs, labor unions, free market economy, freedom of speech, human rights, then you understand that Turkey is a very important source of inspiration. 
When some politicians attack Turkey's EU prospects, they're actually attacking the dreams of those millions of people in the Arab Spring as well. Because those guys are looking at Turkey and saying, well, look at these Turks. They have similar traditions, cultures, geography, and they have done it. They have democracy, they have labor unions, they have free market economy, they have better jobs, they have better schools. Why can we not have the same? There are many leaders who can go and pray with the local people in Egypt today. There are many Western leaders who can go and talk about merits of democracy and secularism in the same countries today. But there are not too many leaders who can do both. When Prime Minister Erdogan goes to Egypt or Libya, he prays with the local people, and then he comes out of the mosque and says, look, I'm a devout believer like you are, but I believe in secular democracy. I'm running a secular democracy. Being secular doesn't mean you have to abandon your religion. It means you give people a chance to practice the religion of their choice. It ensures freedom of religion. I think that proves once again that Turkey is the most eastern part of the West and most western part of the East. And that would be Turkey's most important contribution to European Union. European Union itself is a peace project. If it could help establish peace in Europe, if it could prevent all the wars that were systematically present between member states in the history, then Turkey's membership to the EU would turn this continental peace project to a global peace project. I sometimes joke with my French colleague. I ask him, Pierre, you have no problem living with the Brits and you have a problem living with us in the EU? None of the wars you had with us were as bloody as the wars you had with them. And it's a very challenging question for him to respond. So the biggest impediment between Turkey and the EU is prejudice. And that's what we have to fight, prejudice and ignorance. Prejudice on the part of Turks against Europe, prejudice on the part of Europeans against Turkey, and the best way to fight against prejudice and ignorance is to get to know each other. That is why I'm so grateful that so many Estonians come to Turkey as tourists every year. That's why Europe is our most important source of tourism. Because every tourist that comes to Turkey becomes a friend of Turkey's EU aspirations, and I'm very happy that we entertain them and we host them in uh, such a manner. Of course, I can stand here and talk for hours, because I have challenging arguments, but I want this to be a dialogue rather than a monologue. So I would like to stop here, give a chance to share your views, your comments, your criticism, and ask your questions, and then we can have some exchange of ideas. Thank you for listening to me, and thank you for having me again at this session. Right, so, who would like to begin? This seems like a genuine academic seminar. Students generally don't like to start. Uh, with the questions, but we have one there. Uh, um, can you uh, okay. speak loudly? Yes, uh, I mean, the speech has been very much about principles, but about the practical matters. What do you think about the abolishment of the historical rights of the common agricultural policy and the influence it, going to, it is going to have for Turkey? Because now all the money of the agricultural policy will go to Turkey without these historical rights. And following with that, the structural funds, cohesion funds, all the money that is going to be invested from the European Union there, don't you think that this is the main obstacle more than politics or religion? Thank you. The question is whether it's all about money. Um, we, of course, didn't get as much uh, uh, from the uh, common agricultural policy as we would have justly felt belonged to us either. To be honest with you, we're not after European money. In the last nine years that my party has been in government, we built more roads, hospitals, schools, airports, 
than many countries who received EU funding. We invested more into our agriculture and actually tripled our agricultural outcome production in the last nine years without getting that much assistance from EU funds. Turkey doesn't feel that EU has too much economical benefit. We do not see the EU as an economic union. We don't even see the EU as a political union, but we see EU to be the grandest peace project of the history of mankind. And our approach to EU is we think we can change this continental peace project to a global peace project. The chapter on agriculture, for example, is blocked because Mr. Sarkozy feels like blocking it. But that doesn't slow our reforms in our agriculture. In the last three years, believe it or not, 18 million animals, land and sheep and goat and cow and whatever, have been placed with earrings, with digital, so we can follow animal movement in Turkey. The World Organization on Animal Health has issued documents to prove that the foot and mouth disease no longer exists in Turkish animals in the, in the, in the European side. Those are important for our own food safety. Those are important for our own animal safety. And we will continue to implement the EU rules and regulations because they're good for our country. They're good for our own people. Until last year, when we opened the chapter on food safety, for example, some not organic ingredients could be used in the manufacturing of baby food in Germany. But in response to the opening benchmarks of the chapter on food safety, we made sure that only organic ingredients could be used for baby food manufacture. And they, that made our babies healthier. It's good for us. So, we will continue doing what's right, and we will continue doing uh, uh, the right thing. I was once chatting with a European minister from one of the founding members of the EU. And he said, look, we founded the EU, this is our baby, and when you come in, you will have more leverage than we are. And it's not easy for us to accept this. You will have more representation in the European Parliament, more of a say in the making of the budget, and that's not easy for us to digest. So I said, what do you want to do? Establish like a security council within the EU, like you have in the UN, where the founding members have the right to veto? He said, well, technically that's not really possible. Therefore, we will try our best to delay your membership as much as we can. When we first applied in 1959, Turkey had an income of $400 per person. Today it's $11,000. Turkey had 14 universities, today we have more than 200. Our annual tourism income was $9 million, now it's more than $30 billion. Every day that passes by, Turkey's need for Europe is diminishing. And Europe's need for Turkey is increasing. We will eventually come to an eye to eye level. And that's when this merger will take place. That's when that great rendezvous will take place. Turkey and Europe have a win-win relationship. It might take some time for some to understand this, but at the end, common sense will prevail because it has always prevailed. Right. Um, in your opinion, what should Turkey's position compared to the BRIC uh, states be um, after the uh, uh, financial crisis? Um, what should Turkey's position um, in its relationship with the EU um, 
considering that uh, Turkey's uh, economic growth is uh, much quicker than that of, of the European Union, is one of the highest in, in the world. There's more questions here about uh, also uh, energy and uh, the Azerbaijani Turkey uh, um, gas pipeline uh, and, and Nabucco, of course. So there's a whole host of questions here. The energy would have come up anyhow, I think, but you can perhaps. I think this is very simple. Well, as far as the uh, uh, brick countries, we like to put a T at the end and make it brick. Mm -hmm. um, Turkey is now associated with emerging economies like Brazil, India, Russia, China, um, because of our growth rate and because of the potential. And the countries that make the most out of this potential, as I said, are European countries and European companies. They are very well functioning in Turkey. Just to give you an example, there are 4,700 German companies functioning in Turkey as we speak. Our bilateral trade with Germany has exceeded 30 billion euros last year. And it's growing. It's, it's only natural. Uh, so some politicians might think that people in Baviera might not support Turkey's membership aspirations, but companies coming out of Baviera, like Siemens, like uh, Mercedes, are actually building new manufacturing plants in, in Turkey and using Turkish labor, using Turkish engineers, so things change. Uh, overall, uh, Turkey welcomes uh, that economic cooperation. Brazilian oil company, Petrobras, is now drilling for oil in the Black Sea in cooperation with Turkish state-owned uh, petroleum company. We are now trying to work with Brazilian authorities about biodiesel, uh, how to use the environment for energy purposes. With Russia, we have very important relations. We get around 60% of our gas from the Blue Stream uh, pipeline, which is Russian gas. We also host millions of Russians as tourists in Turkey every year. In China, we are increasing our trade, uh, and by the time we also compete with them, because the Chinese has the largest construction capability in the world, and we have the second largest in the world. So Turkish construction companies are at times doing joint ventures with them, are at times competing against them in some bids in the Middle East or in the Caucasus or in Central Asia. Um, with India, we're increasing our relations. Uh, but none of these relations are alternatives to Turkey's 52-year-old dream to become a part of the EU. I always argue that Turks are very capable, mm -hmm. that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. The fact that we are enhancing our relations with the countries to our east doesn't mean we have to abandon our relations with the countries to our west. We can handle both simultaneously. The question of, is Turkey shifting its axis, was very re relevant last year. It was being asked everywhere I went. And I always argued that Turkey is not shifting anywhere. Turkey is still where she is. But opportunities are shifting. And just like every other country, we are following opportunities. If there are some business to be made, of course, we will go after those opportunities as well. When European economy is shrinking, and 55% of my bilateral trade is with Europe, when Turkey is a member of customs union, and when the supply-demand ratio is changing, of course I have to look for new markets. That's why we're opening, we have opened 10 new embassies in Africa. Because we need to increase our bilateral relations and trade with countries in Africa. That's why we became an observer member to the organization of South American uh, countries, Mercosur, and uh, we are increasing our trade with them. But once again, don't forget, Turkey is the most eastern part of the West and the most western part of the East. And as far as energy is concerned, we intend to be a hub for energy. And that's why the BTC pipeline is working so effectively. That's why we are supporting projects like Nabucco. That's why we have 
some other projects in mind to make sure Turkey is a hub. We want Turkey to be a place where energy resources come together and then are distributed around the world, and that's going to help Europe diversify its energy resources and routes. It's a win-win situation.
recipients enjoy import and export and travel benefits to Northern Cyprus, but they will not allow other member states to have the same privilege. That's an oxymoron. That's a double standard hypocrisy in the simplest terms. Since then, we have encouraged the sides and international community to seek a solution to the Cyprus problem. Both President Talat in the northern side and his consecutive colleague, Mr. Errol, have continued these talks. And now Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has a new timetable ahead of him, which he envisages to have a comprehensive solution. And we have declared that any solution found by the two leaders of the island, the Turkish Cypriot leader and the Greek Cypriot leader, will have 100% support and blessing of Turkey as long as it has, it's based on political equality. And as long as the people on the island, both the Turkish Cypriot and Greek Cypriot, support it. But when we have a timetable ahead of us, all of a sudden the Greek Cypriots want to make holes on the bottom of the Mediterranean to drill for oil, as if the oil there is going to run away, if there is any. We have a timetable ahead of us. Let's wait. I mean, you waited for years. Why can't you wait for another couple of months? That's a simple signal of provocation. That's why I'm saying they're spoiled. That's why I'm saying they're acting silly. I think we should give Secretary General of UN a chance to come up with a comprehensive solution. And by the end of this year, hopefully we will know at least if peace is attainable or not. But the Cyprus problem was not a prerequisite for membership of Cyprus. We cannot allow it to become a prerequisite for membership of Turkey. If Cyprus problem was so important for Europe, why was a divided country accepted as a member? It's against the IT. It's against the Copenhagen criteria. A country that has border problems should not become a member of EU, but it has. Cool. And it's up to 26 others to make sure that they do not bully and take hostage interests of Europe. Professor Mayer. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we need to continue from this point uh, with more serious question. We can overcome this uh, Cyprus question, it's a tiny country, and uh, we invite 26 countries to support you, and we, we definitely support you. But what to do with France and Germany? They have blocked all the negotiations. Chirac promised to put the question about the Turkish membership uh, uh, to referendum even, uh, we remember this, and, and uh, in this uh, context I have uh, a question to you about Turkey's vision about the future of the European Union. Does Turkey support federal European Union we are going to build up or some of you member countries are big? going to build up uh, to solve this financial crisis or uh, decentralized uh, European Union of regions. And this means also how to change the decision-making process that single countries cannot block. What do you think about uh, uh, the whole new structure for European Union. What is the future? How do you see the future? And I remember my last uh, question, uh, uh, which is related how much uh, Turkish people now share this dream about the membership of European Union. What is the support of Turkish people uh, uh, now to join European Union? Can you give la last figures? And, and uh, uh, when uh, last time, uh, last year, this was, you visited uh, the same place, you said that European Union needs Turkey more than uh, Turkey needs European Union. Uh, today you mentioned three projects, uh, only peace project is your interest. Uh, and, uh, or how is this relations today? Uh, have these relations changed in one year? Thank you. Three questions. 
Well, as far as France and Germany, I am. I do not think France and Germany have anything against Turkey. There are some politicians in France and in Germany who might oppose Turkey's marriage. And I'm counting on the wisdom of the French and German nation, voters, to help change the minds of those politicians, if not the politicians themselves. As I argue, there is not too much room for emotions in international relations. International relations are based on interest. Yes, Europe's need for Turkey is still on an increasing trend. And Turkey's need for Europe is a decreasing trend. But this merger will take place when our interests are compatible. As I said, our need is increasing, diminishing, Europe's need is increasing, and we will come to an eye to eye level. I was once visiting one of your member countries where the president had served as commissioner representing her country in Brussels. And she said, look, Mr. Minister, EU is based on consensus. If you have consensus, even the most difficult technical problem can be resolved overnight. But if you don't have consensus, the sizes of your cucumbers can become an impediment against your membership. Once we are ready, which means once we complete all of our chapters, then we would seek the consensus. As far as the Turkish public opinion is concerned, when we ask Turks, do you want Turkey to join EU, despite all the difficulties, 55% still say yes. But when you ask people, do you think Turkey will be admitted as a member, only 30% say yes. It's the other way around in Europe, European Union average, when you ask people, do you want Turkey to join, around 35-40% say yes. But when you ask people, do you think Turkey will join, 60% say yes. So there is lack of confidence on both sides. European public opinion doesn't really want Turkey, but feels that they cannot prevent Turkey from becoming a member. Turkey really wants Europe, but feels we cannot be, we cannot be admitted as a member. My job is to close the gap. However, when we ask Turkish public opinion, do you think the EU reforms help Turkey democratically, economically, human rights wise, 72% say yes. And that means three out of every four people in my country understand that what we're trying to do with our reforms are good for our country, good for our own people. But an alarming number is when you ask Turks, do you think the EU is fair to Turkey? 92% say no. That's an alarming number. And the reason for that is because Turkey is the only candidate country where citizens have to apply for visa to go to Schengen region. Your foreign minister wrote in the international media an op-ed calling it a visa hypocrisy. And he was right. This is really hypocrisy to ask Turks to apply for visas to come to Schengen region when all other candidate countries have visa-free access. When some of the member states do not provide Turkey as much cooperation as Estonia does in the fight against terrorism. When the Cyprus issue is being dealt with with so many double standards. When so many chapters are being blocked in the negotiation process. And when candidate countries are no longer invited to the EU Council summits. It creates a negative attitude vis-a-vis -vis the public opinion. But I think what we need the most in the process is patience. Because I have always argued that common sense will prevail and Turkey's membership to the EU is just a necessity of common sense. 
through time we will resolve our differences and Turkey will become a member of EU. It's not a question of if anymore, it's a question of when. And Mr. Ryan had the second part of his question, which was about when. And then what, is, what is your vision of the European Union? Oh, that was, the vision of that European was something that was a challenge well, for us too when we joined it. In order for us to have a vision of European yeah. Union, first yeah. we have to become a member yeah. of European Union so we can share our vision. Yeah. But realistically, this current decision making process cannot go on forever. The requirement for unanimity in every major decision will force us will force you to a deadlock. The decision-making process has to be re-evaluated, either to qualified majority, and in some cases, to regionalization. This decentralization cannot be stopped. Because now we see people who work 65 hours a week in Germany, or in Estonia, don't want to pay the bills of those who work 30 hours a week in some other countries. And they're saying, well, why should I pay for them when I'm working twice as much? So people want to be responsible for their own local, regional area. History repeats itself. I think the city-state idea will be re-evaluated. I think uh, there is a trend. It's not Turkey's choice or Estonia's choice, but this is a natural trend. On some issues, <coughs> regionalization is a must. But on other issues, for example, for security and defense, this uh, uh, centralization is a must. But on some economical issues or agricultural issues or cultural issues, decentralization is a must. And the question of when, my response is when both sides are ready. Mr. Tanner. And I have to, I'm sorry, uh, I have to admit, you know, 18 million Eastern Germans became full and equal citizens of EU overnight without going through any negotiation process whatsoever. So when there is will, there is way. Maybe we will too. So, or maybe Europe will win the lottery and Turkey will become a member. Sir, I have a question. Associated Press. Um, you mentioned, interestingly, that Turkey has become sort of a role model for the nations of the Arab Spring. Uh, I rather use the term source of inspiration. Right. Uh, but whatever, we, we can see that Turkey has, consciously or not, raised its profile in the, re in the region. And, uh, I was just wondering, is, is this something that is actually causing friction with, with the EU? Because I would, I would think there would be politicians in the EU who, who are not looking not so positively at the growing influence of Turkey. Am I, am I right or am I wrong? I don't think this is causing any friction, friction or frustration vis-a-vis -vis EU. Because what Turkey represents are 100% in line with what EU represents. Our relationship is based on common values. Values like democracy, human rights, free market economy, individual rights. And those are what Turkey defends in this region where Turkey has an influence. And it's apparent that Europe doesn't have as much influence. And Turkey's contribution to Europe in the making of foreign policy and in the implementation of that foreign policy would be very useful for Europe. But as you mentioned, there might be some politicians who might feel that they are being overshadowed. I mean, if I was a politician in Europe and if I went to Libya and only 200 people showed up to listen to me, and when the Turkish Prime Minister goes to the same square two days later, and 20,000 people show up to listen to him, you know, that might not be an easy feeling to digest. <laughs> but is this a problem for Europe? No, quite the contrary, because the message given by Turkey is so unique and so needed that even that leader should be happy that at least those people are there to listen to that message. 
Turkish experience of coexisting culture of Islam with culture of democracy goes back more than 200 years. And I think that's a very important experience to share with the local people. That's why Turkey is a source of inspiration. This democracy is not a one-size-fits-all sub. Democracy is shaped by nations, traditions, cultures, history. And every country has to come up with their own notion of democracy. In our 200 years of experience, we have made some major accomplishments. From there, they can really learn a lot. But we have also made some major mistakes. There were some military coups in our history. There were some executions of prime ministers in our history. And those mistakes can also shed a light to them so they don't have to make the same mistakes. Uh, did you have to follow up? Just, just following up. So, um, you mentioned also the very good relations with Russia that Turkey has, as traditionally politically and economically. Is this something, what could Turkey give to EU vis-a-vis -vis Russian policies? Could you? Well, uh, countries do not get to choose their neighbors but they can choose the level of their relations with their neighbors. And we have learned to respect our neighbors, be it Russia, be it Iran, be it Syria, be it Georgia, be it Greece. Russia is an important country with a strong economy, a member of the Security Council of the United Nations. We might not look eye to eye on every issue. We have similar interests on some aspects. We have quite opposite interests in some other aspects. But at least we have a dialogue. And our dialogue with Russia can be of great use to the EU as well. But I see we have three, four questions left, but we have um, a little bit more than five minutes before you have your let's meeting with all, ministers. So yeah, let's, let's take them take together. All questions and I'll let's take them together. together. So we'll start answers. with the lady. Hello, Mr. Minister. Uh, as you said in this nice leaflet, that the EU is also it's based on demo, demo, democratic values, and so is Turkey. But in Turkish legislation, there are many laws that distinguish males and females. Like in the family law, it says that the man is the head of the family. Or that after the divorce... We uh, change that. We change that. In the uniform process. Okay. And for example... Uh, <laughs> there are, uh, but I'm not saying we fixed everything. We still have issues. That's why the yeah, uniform process bringing, is important. Yeah, I was bringing some up. And for example, a marriage abolition for women after divorce, which is 300 days, but is, there is none for men. Like, does other the Gaspin Bobato CC, are there coming any changes that uh, uh, bring up these uh, democratic values, gender equality? Are there improvements coming that uh, can show us these steps? Well, there are many developments. I can uh, assure you, Turkey has a very uh, strong minister in the cabinet who is in charge of these issues, the Minister for uh, Family and Social Policy, uh, Mrs. Uh, Shine, is very determined to fix those issues, and she has already tackled most of them. Many changes have been made, uh, but this 300-day issue uh, has to do with the uh, law on uh, actually property distribution. Because if uh, there's pregnancy involved and they want to determine the, uh, the parental rights, I think that was uh, an old tradition, uh, old clubs, but uh, all these issues are not being evaluated. That's why it's so important to keep the reform process going. The EU reform process is the most important external motivator for our, for our changes. Let's take the other questions quickly. Uh, two gentlemen there. Yeah. Uh, I'm a very interesting point. 
Uh, I understand that Turkey still wishes uh, strongly to, to join the EU, and I totally agree with you that uh, it shouldn't be seen as an economical project, rather a biggest uh, peace process uh, project uh, uh, in the region. Uh, but nevertheless, um, what about the Eurozone? Is joining that monetary union also on the Turkish agenda, given the circumstances and difficulties that the monetary union is facing today? And uh, especially, uh, how do you feel about uh, uh, being in the same monetary union with your lovely neighbor, Greece? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the next question. Uh, the historian, Timothy uh, Gartenash, he said that one of the sort of key driving forces behind the European integration is that every, every country has sort of escaped from some negative past or present, such as uh, well, the Second World War or the Soviet past in this, this country, for instance. Is there something that, that Turkey is escaping from from what's good behind? Final question. Uh, when Estonia uh, started negotiating for a membership in the European Union, one of the selling points to our populace was that um, Estonia would be an intermediary between Europe and Russia because we have know-how. Now, given, given uh, Turkey's increasing influence and political clout in the Islamic world, uh, wouldn't you say it increases Turkey's, uh, actually increases Turkey's uh, chances of EU accession because, of, uh, because you know, it's better to have a powerful friend inside than outside? Okay, as far as the Eurozone is concerned, we will follow the Estonian experience and make our decision when the time is right for, to make a decision. Right now, we don't have to make that decision to join the Eurozone or not, because we're not in the European Union. Once we join the Union, we will decide. Uh, but we're watching your experience very carefully. As far as being in the same currency uh, with our lovely neighbors, we don't mind. Some countries in the Eurozone are doing great, some are doing greater. Uh, it's not what you have, it's what you do with it, as they say. Uh, so the currency doesn't change your economy, the way you utilize the currency affects your economy. So it's not really a major issue. Uh, for us. But again, that decision should be made when we have to make that decision, and today is, we don't have to make that decision. Is Turkey escaping from anything? It's a very interesting question that you raised. Probably Turkey is not escaping, but going back to its roots. The times when, as a nation, Turks were the most prosperous, the most successful, the most uh, influential, is when individual rights were very much at the center of policy making. The Ottoman Empire, for example, was based on individualism. The whole idea was strengthen the individual so that the state can be powerful. And that's actually what Europe is based on individual rights. So in a way, we might be escaping from some dark periods in our period too, but we're not escaping to a new port, a new haven. We're actually going back to our own roots, where individual rights will be re-engineered and re-strengthened. And I think that's a very important issue. Can we be a bridge to the Islamic world, like Estonia was to Russia? Yes, but not limited to. Not only 1.5 billion Muslims around the world, but more importantly, 3 billion humans around the world who feel that they have been isolated or ignored by the West are following Turkey's U.S. pressures very closely. If you check the PhD theses prepared in China, in Africa, in India, in unique parts of the world, that you realize that Turkish EU relations are at the center of their uh, agenda. So Turkey can be a bridge. Turkey has historically been a bridge between Europe and Asia. 
between Islam and Christianity, between energy resources and consumers, between supply and demand. But Turkey is also a hub. And what we are doing in Turkey right now is we are strengthening all four legs of the bridge simultaneously. The eastern, the western, northern and southern legs are being strengthened because nobody would want to pass across a weak bridge or a bridge with a weak leg. So for a bridge to be dependable, it has to sit on four strong legs, and that's what we're doing in Turkey. And I thank each and every one of you for your interest in my ideas and for coming here and listening. Okay. And thank the institution for having me. Thank you. Thank you. welcome you to come a third time, but then, of course, we hope that you will be a member of the European Union together with us. Well, I hope to come here every year, and uh, <laughs> next year, if you can make us a member, go ahead. <laughs>